it doesn't give me that peace of mind or the peace of mind doesn't outweigh all the other you know all the other benefits that i have by not paying it early and uh, you know enjoying that high return somewhere else where and at the same time i still have um, I'm, i'm comfortable paying it so it's not like a huge payment we can do it so once we've done it it's like okay we know we can do it but we'll we choose not to do it You're listening to the Millionaire's Unveiled podcast, where you'll hear the stories and interviews of everyday millionaires. We'll unveil their decisions, their strategies, and their current portfolio allocation. Now to your hosts, Clark Sheffield and Jace Mattinson. Welcome back to another episode of the Millionaires in Veil podcast. This is episode number 259. Before we begin today, I just wanted to take a quick moment of silence to remember those who were so greatly affected uh, by the events of 9-11. You know, I think back to, to that day and I vividly remember myself where I was when I saw all the news and, and everything that has, has happened and transpired since. And so I just wanted to take a quick moment to, to remember those Uh, you know, who lives were lost and those were drastically affected and who may have lost a loved one or uh, a colleague or something like that. Okay, so this week we have Vlad. He has a net worth of $1.1 million in immigrant, and he has a remarkable story that you do not want to miss. Last week, we had several episodes of some updates with previous millionaires. The most recent one uh, on Friday was with Sam. He started working on Wall Street and then uh, became a blogger and, and an author. And so he was originally on episode 132, and his net worth was around $3 million uh, at the time of that original recording. So great episode with him, great update. You know, it's interesting. I've gotten a lot of emails lately, uh, you know, on various topics and you know, what, what are my thoughts on the financial markets and on the economy in general. And, you know, there's, there's a lot going on, that's for sure. And, and I think a lot of uncertainty and unknown, you know, Fed seems to continue to, to raise rates. We're, we're looking at, you know, some record inflation and, you know, there's a lot of companies that, uh, having layoffs or trying to restructure or also all sorts of things. So, you know, I think it's a great time to continue to just plug and play. I haven't changed my strategy one bit. In fact, I continue to, to keep doing the same things I was doing five years ago and 10 years ago and two years ago in the middle of the pandemic. So might expand a little bit more on some of that down the road here as I've gotten several specific questions and whatnot, I may address a few of those on the podcast. But at any rate, it is something to, to pay attention to. I think, you know, I'm, I'm watching the news and, you know, various companies and, and things like that and the Fed and what they're doing and, and uh, just like everybody else. So at any rate, real excited for, for the fall here. Uh, I think it's a great time of year. We've got several great millionaire interviewees uh, in the pipeline right now. And uh, we'll continue to re- release amazing episodes here. Got a lot of good ones coming up. And if you're interested in being on the podcast, shoot a shoot an email over to us at uh, millionairesunveiled at gmail.com, and uh, we'll get you on the schedule for that. So without any further delay, let's get in the interview with Vlad. Vlad, you want to just give us a little about your background and what you're up to now? Yeah, sure. I, uh, like you said, my name is Vlad, and uh, uh, I'm actually originally not from the U.S., so I came from a little country in Eastern Europe uh, back when I was 19. And at that time, I, I came in this country. I had uh, $1,000 in my pocket. You know, that's what my parents gave me. But then uh, for, uh, for the 14 years later, the, uh, I'm in uh, really the top, uh, I'd say, 10% by net worth in the U.S. So that's definitely, not that I'm proud, but I'm, I'm very, let's say, uh, I'm very blessed and, and uh, I'm lucky to, you know, to have uh, taken that step and, and to come into this country and, and to get to this status. Yeah, and what is your net worth today? So today my net worth is uh, right around 1.1 million. So it's a little bit shy of 1.1. Awesome. And what is that broken up between? So I would say... Um, I mean, I actually have it in front of me here. So um, I could uh, say percentage-wise, uh, home equity is about 46%. Then uh, retirement and Roth is 32%. Uh, the next one up is college fund, uh, 529 is about 9%. Then uh, brokerage account, 7%. Cash, about 2%. Cars, 
two percent. Okay, and do you have any debt? Currently, the only debt is the mortgage. And how much is left on the mortgage? So the mortgage about three hundred k. Okay, so you're getting pretty close to to paying that down or off here pretty soon. Yeah, I would say uh, we recently actually my wife and I bought the house last year, so it's a fifteen year. Uh, mortgage but what we did is we sold our previous house which was paid in full and we put it all in this house interesting so i, I want to touch on that a little bit because that's it's pretty unique so you go from a paid for house decide to either expand or or, or scale up or what however move up however you want to just describe it and you took on a mortgage what was that like mentally emotionally because that's typically not usually what what we hear people do and guests do. I mean, it happens a few times, but that that I, I think it's becoming more common. And so, if you don't mind, would you elaborate just you know emotionally and and mentally, kind of what was going through your heads when you decided to do that and take on a mortgage after you didn't have one? Yeah, sure. Actually, I want to take it maybe a step back and and say why did I pay my previous house uh, in full? And uh, if I were to do it all over again, I'll probably not do it. I'll I'll still be aggressive, but not pay it in full. So so the the way I got to pay my house in full, and I've heard the other uh, you know other uh, people that you guys got on your podcast uh, mentioned Dave Ramsey. So I would say about four years ago, three years ago, I started listening to Dave Ramsey and, and really following following him to the you know following him religiously. And so this is when actually we paid off the house. We we had some extra cash sit, sitting around in savings, paid off the house, we cut off all the credit cards. And then I'd say about a year after we did that, you know, I, I kinda I studied a little bit more, uh, started listening to different podcasts. One of them is Mo- the Money Guy show. And I realized that Dave Ramsey he's good, he's great. But uh, you know then there's a point of graduation. There's a point where you know, there some debt is, is not that, you know, a little bit debt, like if it's good debt, is not bad. And this is where uh, I said that whenever we get our next house, uh, we'll, we'll uh, you know, still put a big chunk down so we have this uh, comfortable monthly payment, but we're not gonna rush to pay it off. Instead, you know, like right now, the mortgage interest is about 2.3%. Uh, so instead of paying the, the house down, uh, can take the money and just put it in the market and make at least 10 percent uh, on on the investment so i would say we went from you know a really conservative take all the risk out to at least you know the mortgage the mortgage is uh, i i consider it good debt was it listening to the money guys that, that had you make that shift m- emotionally or you know because th- especially dave ramsey and i think just people in general talk about paying off the mortgage is such an emotional thing and and you made that switch and now it's like yeah whatever i have a monthly payment on the on the house i view it as good debt and so your interest costs especially on a 15 years and you know nil nothing How, walk walk us through was it just the money guy show that that, that helped you through that or you know why for what 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 took place to, to have you have that mindset shift? I would say uh, it's really the the Money Guy show was was a big uh, was a big help there. But at the same time, um, when we tried to when we tried to move into this house, since we had most of the most of the money tied into the other house, right? There was a big chunk of money was tied into the, it was paid in full. So for us to move in, it's a into to this new house was a, a step up was a little bit more expensive say about twice more so we didn't have the full 20 percent put down uh, we had about you know we didn't have the full 20 percent. so now we had to go to either do like a e-lock or whatever we call that heloc or a borrow from the 401k or we had to really coordinate to sell the house first and, and buy this one so i would say that really also put it say okay and it, it once we get to an age let's say 45 or 50 i think that's what the money guy say show says uh, then probably think of uh, paying off the mortgage but uh, at this point uh, it it doesn't really it doesn't give me that peace of mind or the peace of mind doesn't outweigh all the other you know all the other benefits that i have by not paying it early and uh, you know enjoying that high return somewhere else where and at the same time i still have um, I'm, I'm comfortable paying it so it's not like a huge payment that uh, it's not a huge percent percentage of my income to to pay this uh, mortgage yeah and i, I would say maybe a quick uh, to wrap this up is we um, paid the other house in about five years so it was more like a almost like a race almost like a, a, like a, to prove that 
we can do it. So once we've done it, it's like, okay, we know we can do it, but we'll, we choose not to do it. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. So let me push you on this a little bit, Vlad. Your house, 500000 in equity, right? Correct. And you said you have 300 left, so $800,000 house. So 500, your net worth is 1.1. So as a percentage, your house is a pretty big percentage of your net worth. Correct. Do you feel like you have too much house? At this point, uh, we def or I definitely don't don't think we have too much house as far as um, i'd say when we bought it it was a little bit you know the the price has recently increased over the last year so that probably what put it out there but uh, it's really our dream house uh, as of you know as of a year ago and it still is it's, it's like this it has every little space is you know it's what we need and we have uh, three children and then we have um, my uh, my wife's dad is is coming here and helping us as well so the house i would say is really what we needed but uh, I, I get what you're saying you know it's a little bit on the high end there so you know that's why now we're trying to to slowly build all the you know the other assets like the, the more more cash more in the brokerage account more money there and so and any extra saving that's really where, where it's going today. Yeah. No, I was just curious. You can say, Clark, no, that's a dumb question. Cause if I thought it was too much house, I, I wouldn't still own it. <laughs> you know, I mm-hmm. would just sell it. So I don't mean to be rude. I was just curious on your, on your thinking there. No, it's a good point. And I believe, believe me, yeah, we went through, uh, you know, the same questions. Is it too much house? Is it not? So the way we arrived to this conclusion, initially, we still had that mindset. Let's, let's collect more cash and put more down payment, maybe pay it in full. But then we said, we also want to leave today. We want to leave in, in, in the nice house, which is not too crazy. We're not going to put us back. But at the same time, you know, we live in a nice house and you you, you pay that uh, mortgage, which is not too crazy. So we enjoy it now while we're still good with uh, making good financial decisions. Yeah. So also a big chunk of your net worth in, in 10% is in education accounts. So that I think that's probably, Jace, is that maybe the biggest education account we've seen? About 100,000? Yeah, I think it's, it's definitely up there up for there. sure. Yeah, especially at your age. Yeah. So how how come so much there, and how'd you how'd you build that up so quickly? Uh, so what we did, uh, and you, know, it's, you guys are, are really catching the things that I'm I'm uh, I'm kind of adjusting. So what we we have three kids, uh, three children, and for each one, my wife and I we said, okay, let's just put thirty thousand dollars for each, and then be done with. It. So we did for the for the first one, we did that within like within two. So for, within two years, we're trying to build that thirty k for each. Then for the second one, we did put twenty k, and then this year we're supposed to put another k. And then for the third one, we start with ten k, and this the next year we're supposed to do twenty k. But then we realized that our college fund is slowly uh, becoming bigger than our brokerage account and our cash, uh, and and. And to me, that, that that was a flag. Say, okay, hold on a second. While it's good to take care of your kids and, and to prepare for their college, I think we need to slow it down a little bit. Uh, we're still going to do the 30K each. Uh, but uh, first, let's say I want to buy, you know, a car in a few years that and I want to do it cash, then I don't want that to be, you know, half of my brokerage account or, you know, even a third of my brokerage account. So we decided to slow it down a little bit. But I would say the reason why we were doing it, I don't know, maybe it's because we're coming from a, um, you know, a different country. We really took advantage of the education here and we, we wanted our children to to have that opportunity and to, to really not be... I'd say um, not have this as a obstacle saying, oh, I don't have, I cannot pay for college. So we have it there, put it in 529s, you're not going to use it, then we still have, you know, there is a way for us to take it back with, you know, some penalty and all that. But yeah. No, I, I follow you. You say 30,000 a kid. That makes sense. You just knocked it out early. So correct. Yes. Yeah, good for you. No, no problem there at all. So in terms of allocation and, and other real estate, no other real estate holdings, right? Correct. No other. Is that something you'll be involved? in or not as much um, not as much uh, and honestly my wife and I we do have where we had vast debate whether to do real estate or not like when we sold the previous house so maybe we, we, we should keep it we should 
to, to renters. But um, so far, I, I'm just I'm I'm hearing all these horrible stories about renters and and how you know just leaving your money in an index fund really uh, I'm not sure if it's the same about you know when you take the growth of the index fund uh, compared to the appreciation of the house plus the monthly uh, rental income, but it's it's very comparable and without with no hassle no so so far we we've heard too many horrible stories and and when i i did my calculation it just didn't really make sense uh, because both my wife and i we have full-time jobs and uh, you know probably it's it doesn't make sense for us right now yeah yeah no i was curious so we've talked about net worth and allocation 1.1 1. 1, 500 in the house about 400 in the markets 350 in retirement 100 in education accounts let's jump back to your story here i know you came from humble beginnings you been in the States for 14 years, I believe, if I remember correctly. Tell us a little bit about your story, Vlad. How did all this get started? Okay, yeah. So, uh, so I, again, uh, I heard, I mean, I came to this country when I was 19, uh, winning the green card, the diversity visa lottery uh, that the U.S. does every year. They, they allow 50,000 people to come into, into the United States. And that really was, to me, that was a gift from God. I mean, a lot of people that I talk to in this country, they don't, uh, or not, I, I shouldn't say they don't, but they, they're not aware of what, what we have here. You know, now I'm a U.S. citizen, so uh, I'm, I'm considering myself part of everyone, but um, you know, I'm, I'm just grateful for that. So coming in this country, uh, the first two months, I'd say it was the hardest because I came here, there was no job. Uh, I, my, actually, my cousin was living here, so I, uh, he helped me with the apartment. So I was you know, just had enough money to pay rent for a couple months, uh, food. But then the first two months were the hardest um, until I found a, a job. I was in a restaurant, uh, dishwasher in a, in a restaurant. Uh, and slowly, slowly, I progressed myself through a bunch of different restaurant jobs until I, I got to a server waiter and uh, there was making really good money and uh, at the same time uh, i started going to college so having uh, you know having that decent income uh, working three four four nights a week in a really good restaurant and then going to college uh, that really helped me and did, when did I, you speak english at this time so in initially when i got here uh, i would say my english was okay but my confidence was not <laughs> I was very shy. I was like, okay, if I say a word wrong or if I, you know, have an accent, what would people say? So I'd say not so much, but then I started going to community college and, and uh, the first two semesters was all English. So I really learned the proper English. I really learned the, you know, the reading, writing and all that. And also in college, I was uh, I was just very motivated to get to the end. So I was taking at least, either, if not five, six classes every semester while still having a full-time job. Wow. So, I mean, really a true American success story coming here on a, on a green card. What was that like? I mean, did, did you ever envision yourself becoming a millionaire and getting to, I mean, obviously you wanted to leave and come to the United States for the opportunities to come here, but did you ever think that you would get to the success that you've gone to now? That's a great question. Yeah. Honestly, uh, when I when hearing millionaires uh, back in the days, uh, yeah, that was a very very far goal. And, you know, in my mind, and, and having all the the friends that I or the people that around me that at the time, um, I, I was thinking that maybe one day, but maybe in my mind, I was like, okay, maybe when I retire or when I was when I'll be fifty or sixty or that's that's really it was a was a far fetched goal, and then. I would say definitely the surroundings, the people around you, that that definitely has an impact. So then later in life, as I, I changed my uh, my circle, uh, I got to you know got to a really nice job, start making more money, start becoming good with with, uh, with money, with uh, knowing how how comp compound interest works, uh, how you know how to s uh, spend less than you make. That really that picture then became a reality. So I would say about two years ago we or say okay we're we're on track to to hit it in about five years but actually got it a little bit sooner so that's awesome what did you study in college uh, so in college uh, there's a few funny stories there but i actually changed my major three times uh, so initially it was business administration i didn't really like that then i went into architecture because somebody told me that i'll make a lot of money <laughs> but then i quickly realized that that's definitely not for me then i took a test in college and that really helped me to land on information technology 
knowledge. And that's what I'm really doing today. And, and that's what I love doing. So Awesome, Vlad. So here we are. You immigrated to this country. You've done phenomenal for yourself. Started at the bottom restaurant. I mean, literally worked tail off to get to where you are now. Built up substantial net worth. You're living in your dream house. You've got a couple kids. Where do you go from here at this point? Mm, that, that's a good point. Um, so I'd say from here, I mean, uh, we, we're constantly learning and constantly evolving. But uh, right now, I'd say in, a, uh, in about the past two years, I really uh, started becoming more and more interested in um, spirituality uh, uh, especially i'm doing meditation so no no affiliation to any religion or anything like that but uh, i definitely feel that uh, you know that connection and, and i go uh, spiritually higher and higher and uh, i've seen that that really helped me with really anything in life uh, including finances including family including um, friends so i'd say become more uh, you know, more serious about my meditation, but at the same time, you know, uh, continuously advance in my career, continuously uh, take on new challenges uh, and not not be afraid to to take on risks and uh, and really, con- you know, continuously, continuously improve. And uh, if I were to put the money goal, I don't think I really have uh, like a money goal right now, but uh, what the goal would be is to maybe retire a little bit earlier uh, than uh, you know than the the retirement age, and then just you know, we'll see where we go from there. So I'd say the the main goal is now is uh, re- retire early. At what age would you expect to or like to retire? Based on based on my projection, if if things go the way they've been going, I'd say at, at least uh, you know, like forty two to forty five. Uh, that's definitely a really good. Uh, fair attainable. So that's what, another decade for you? Pretty much, yes. And just high level, what would your net worth roughly be at that? And then how do you plan to kind of fund that early retirement? So I'd say, uh, based on my projections, because I'm crazy about spreadsheets and, uh, you know, kind of projection, projecting stuff. So I do have all that laid out year by year. And uh, that's, um, so I'd say by, by, the, by the age, let's say 45, I should have, or our family should have without, so with with the house included, it's right around five million dollars if if everything goes as as they wow. as it's been going, and it's really I'd say on the conservative side. Too. Wow. So let me just jump back here to your upbringing, Vlad. Growing up, humble beginnings. You said, how does that impact your life now? I would say. It- definitely appreciate it i definitely you know i wouldn't change anything uh, in the past or anything in the present as well but i wouldn't really change anything in the past because that really taught me uh, to to really um, go out there and, and get it for myself and, and don't wait for anyone to to give it to me and that's what i'm you know, that's that's really what I'm. Uh, I'm hoping for my children to to not really. You know, you you hear the saying that 80 percent of, uh, of the millionaires are self-made or are first generation, I should say. Uh, so. My hope is that uh, you know somehow we, we don't, I don't lose that with my children, and they even though they don't you know now that uh, they're in a say they're young and their parents became millionaire they don't you know they don't know but hopefully somehow we we teach them and, and we keep that going that motivation and that uh, that drive and, and not wait for for us to you know to make their living but for themselves to kind of aspire and, and and build this on their own. Yeah, so let's talk about that. Do you have a will already? I know you're young, young 30s here. Do you, do you have a will already? Actually, that's what one thing we don't. Uh, and that's what we've been talking and putting it off. It's it's one thing that we know we need to do. So yeah, no will in place. So when do you start thinking about, I mean, you're obviously a ways out here, but three kids, you're, you're thinking about saving for their education, $30,000 each you have right now, about 100,000 in education accounts. When do you start thinking about generational wealth and, and what that looks like? Because if you're already at 1.1, 1.2 million, you're in your young 30s, obviously that's going to grow. You'll get to at least several million dollars. Do you, any thoughts on what you plan to leave to your kids, if any? Yeah, my my true or my belief is that um, you know knowledge is knowledge, wisdom is 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 worth you know it's worth it's pretty much that you don't put a money a dollar sign to it. So any any dollar. I wouldn't really uh, say that I wouldn't be proud to leave my children any uh, dollar amount rather than 
some good teachings and, and to really teach them how to make their own money. Because when you make your own, not only money, but anything really, it's you feel that sense of accomplishment. You feel that sense of, okay, I got it myself. Uh, I'm not going to just waste it. So if I were to, to guess, uh, you know, very minimum, uh, other than education, right? we're going to provide them really good education. Uh, but anything else, uh, you know, they'll, they'll have to, to learn how to do it themselves. Yeah. yeah. So l- let's talk mistakes here, Vlad. W- what are some of the biggest, if any, big financial mistakes you've made? Yeah, that's, uh, you know, like I'd say everyone, right? We, we, we're human beings. We, we make mistakes. But for me, one of my, if we were to talk about money mistakes, was uh, when I came to this country uh, about a year and a half in, uh, I was working at that time two restaurant jobs. I was really, you know, putting a lot of hours. That the the wage the wage or the hour, the hourly wage wasn't much, but uh, I was putting a lot of hours making overtime. So I got to about over thirty thousand dollars in my savings account. And at that time, uh, I had a roommate. He was uh, he was claiming that he was making easy money. And then I asked him, okay, so what what do you do? How do you do it? And he, I'd say, he didn't go full in. He just told me bits and pieces. I was like, okay, yeah, I play with stocks. I do day trading. So hearing that he makes good money, like, okay, why don't I start making good money too? So this is where I took all my money and started playing with stocks. And I'd say about two weeks in, it was uh, it was right around 2008 when you know when the, the stock market crashed. So I put all my money into one stock and that was uh, General Motors. Uh, at that time, it was a dollar. And that dollar went to a couple cents. I forgot it was like nine or ten cents. So you can imagine my thirty thousand dollars went to about three thousand dollars. So I'd say that was one of my biggest mistakes. And the the good thing is that you went right back up to about ninety or something cents. And you you'd have thought that you know I would have learned from this. I'm like no, <laughs> I kept playing the stocks, the penny stocks, until my thirty thousand dollars got to about 4000 and then I quit. Say no, I'm going to take this money out. I'll at least buy a car and then just let me, I'll come back to investing later when I know more about it. Okay. Yeah, you shared that. It's an interesting story. So do, do you do any single stocks at all now? Right now, I do have actually uh, in my Roth IRA, I do have three stocks that I just bought it and I keep it there. They're well known as Amazon, Apple, and um, Microsoft. That's Apple. my three stocks that I have. Everything else is uh, either is index fund or ETFs, or like mutual funds or ETFs. Well, those are three good ones to have. They've been on quite the run here the last, especially three years. Yeah, I, I, I definitely, you know, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm up of the opinion that uh, I'm not buying the stock, I'm buying the company, I'm buying the product. So I, I have all their products and I'm using them every day and I love it. You know, that's that's why I buy their stock. Yeah. So as you were working, Vlad, was there a percent, a certain percentage of your income that you would try to save? What was your savings rate throughout this whole process? I would say initially, before kids, we were we were very crazy savers, uh, probably sixty to seventy percent. And now, now it's about. Uh, and when we talk saving, we talk about four hundred one k and everything. Correct? That's what you're asking. Correct. Yes, sir. Yes. So, so right now, it's uh, I would say it's about thirty five to forty. Let's say forty percent. Uh, of, of saving, it, it's gone down a little bit uh, since you know our life expanded a little bit. But we're really lucky to start uh, saving the big chunk of our income early on. And, and right now, we we're at the point we can relax a little bit and we can live, you know, can enjoy life a little bit more. Or still not not go all all crazy in, but uh, now we can reduce that saving to about forty to thirty five percent. So just to clarify, when you say thirty five forty percent, is that of your take home or is that of your gross pay? Uh, that is uh, actually that's actually of the take home. Okay, so after taxes, you take home and you save thirty five forty percent of what you take home. Yeah, that's high. That. That's high. Good for you. So you you talk about living a little bit more and maybe taking the foot off the savings rate. Well, how much do you spend a year? And and I'm curious. How how that has increased as you become a millionaire? How much do we spend a year? So I'd say the biggest expense for us, um, obviously, is the house, then the food, uh, now the daycare, right? the, the kids. And at the same time, now we, we're trying to dedicate at least $10,000 for vacation per year. Um, we haven't, I don't think we've reached that 10000 yet, but we're trying hard to say, okay, we have the 
budget, we have the allowance, let's just, let's go and, and have some fun. So as far as the total expenses, uh, what I'm seeing here uh, for last year actually was around 90K. 90K uh, for the annual expenses for you? Correct. Okay, okay, gotcha. So about, about yes, $8,000 a month or so, seven to eight? Correct. Okay. And that, does that include the mortgage? Uh, does, yeah, that includes the mortgage. So pretty much everything. Yeah. How much vacation. is your mortgage payment? Uh, the mortgage payment is a little bit shy of 3000 so it's like 2950 something like that. Okay, so if you take housing out, you spend about about 60, 55, 60k, 55k or so. Correct. Okay. So who who was your who was your big who was a mentor to to you or who had the biggest influence on you through your life? That's that's a really good question. So uh, I would say in my very first job in the U.S., coming from from um, from my former I'd say Soviet Union country, um, you know, people there don't really show emotions; they don't smile, um, even now, right? Even now, after what twenty something years after the Soviet Union collapse, uh, but um, say the the very first job, uh, the manager there, I had an accident in the job, and uh, and he, uh, you know, one day when I had the accident, after the accident, he really gave me like a motivational talk and say, look, um, you can do anything, you, you really can. I mean, don't don't look at me that I'm I'm older and I'm having this nice car and, and I'm my manager. You know, one day you can be there too. So me being a kid, 19, uh, having that mindset that everybody wants, you know, everybody's rude, everybody just kind of the back home mentality. I really took this on and, and really, that really helped. That was a really good uh, inspiration. But then after that, uh, my job, uh, I got a couple of mentors that really, really helped me uh, kind of with my confidence, with uh, becoming more, let's say, more advancing in my career. I definitely had a few good ones at at my current job and, and I'm keeping that up because, uh, you know, you always, there's always somebody ahead of you. There's always somebody that you can learn from. So, and, and I never really stopped that avenue. Yeah. Is there a, sir, I'll jump into some rapid fire questions here. Is there a, sure. you talk about never stopping learning. Is there a source or a couple sources or books, websites, podcasts, anything that's had a big influence on you and your financial journey, trying to figure out all this stuff? Yes. So the very first one, like I think I mentioned, I'm not sure, Dave Ramsey was a really good uh, base, a really good foundation. Uh, then the Money Guy show was really, you know, really, really, I really uh, learned a lot from them. That really, you know, got me interested in, in all the, like the 529s, the 401ks, the Rafa arrays, and all the this little tricks and tips. And uh, that then later I, I actually got to research on my own. So I'd say those and then uh, some spiritual books uh, I I read, uh, I just recently read The Complete Works of Florence Scoble Shin. Uh, she's a spiritual, she's, she left the planet a long time. Really, really inspiring. I really like the book. Okay. Uh, at what age were you, did you become a millionaire? Uh, actually at the... Uh, so right, it was actually right before my birthday. So 32 turning to 33. Young, young, way to go. Congrats on that. Um, what's you. been the most expensive car you've ever purchased? So the most expensive car uh, was actually $33,000. And then uh, a year or not, a, yeah, about a year later, we we found out we're having our third child. We trade that in for a less expensive uh, minivan, uh, which... Uh, yeah, uh, it was about 22. Well, good. At least now you're driving in style. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, what's been your most expensive trip or vacation? Uh, the most expensive trip, uh, we maybe uh, we, we took a trip to Hawaii, but that was probably not the most expensive. The most expensive one was back in 2014 when we, we went back home to do our wedding. So my wife and I, the, the ticket one way or bo uh, round trip ticket was seventeen hundred bucks free per person. Ouch! Uh, plus, you know, gifts and all that. So that was probably the biggest expense yeah. so far. Yeah, it's your wedding, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, do you ever have you ever used a financial advisor? Uh, we did, or we did not. Uh, I got into a few, you know, consultation, but uh, I never felt that. Um, I would benefit at this point from them. Uh, like maybe when my net worth increases and I want to do a little bit more, uh, do a, some other stuff, then probably I'd consider somebody like the money guy, somebody there's uh, fee only and no, um, no commission like that. But yeah, for now, I don't yeah. want. Okay. What's been your range of household income? So initially when I 
got into this country was seven dollars an hour to now uh, my wife and I together are on two forty a year, forty k. Wow, wow, way to go! And, and she works outside the home as well. Yes, so we both work uh, major in a large corporation. Okay, so. Vlad, just wrapping up here, we talk about your young millionaire, 1.1 million young 30s here. Has this money brought happiness? Honestly, the the money itself, uh, I wouldn't say happiness, but it really brought stability, brought good foundation. The, um, but no, I wouldn't I wouldn't really say that now that I'm a millionaire, I'm 2.0 happy. No, I'd say it probably it's about the same. It's more of the journey that really helped us, uh, like myself, my wife, to to grow together to become. I'd say happier, but it wasn't really about the the millionaire. You know, the millionaire sounds cool, and don't get me wrong, but it, I don't think that really made us happier. Yeah. Do your friends and family know that you're a millionaire, and do they treat you differently being such a young millionaire? Honestly, we're more private, so we're maybe well, I've shared with my like my mom, and she's a little bit you know open minded, but uh, other people not really. Yeah, we we don't really share much. Okay. So last question here, Vlad. You. you you mentioned a couple things, mistakes and advice, but last words of advice here as you wrap up. I mean, how were you able to do this so quickly if somebody came to you and say, hey, I want to be like that guy, right? I want to reach a million in my young 30s. How, do you, how did you do it? What would you say? I'd say what I would tell to them is that uh, really what came to my mind now, no preparation or anything, but uh, don't try to be cool. Don't try to be, try to, you know, be that boring guy or girl that, uh, you know, kind of, Maybe people talk behind your back. Uh, so I really like this question where they say, um, you know, initially they ask you why, or why are you doing it? But then later on they're asking, so how, how did you do it? You know, how did you do it? So like the same person would ask you why, then they would ask you how. Let's say if you keep keep it simple, if you don't keep up uh, with, you know, buy the new car every year uh, or whatever, the new gadget. And then one thing that would have helped me uh, somehow, and I, I don't even know if I would have taken the advice, is that save, start saving and, and investing earlier. Um, maybe like if if I knew the concept of compounding interest, if I knew the, the, the concept of how this really becomes an avalanche, uh, somewhere like around 16, 17, it just you know, put whatever money I had extra, just put it there, even though I wasn't in this country, but say if I were. Uh, so I would say that first one, but then really start investing early and, and don't really play this uh, meme stocks, but slow and steady. The game. Clark, did we lose you? All right, Vlad. Well, thanks for coming on. Again, everybody, that's Vlad Networth of 1.1 million. Thanks for coming on and, and sharing your story. Thank you. Thank you. It was my pleasure. And you guys are doing a great job. Keep it up. Thanks, Vlad. Thanks for listening to the Millionaire's Unveiled podcast with Clark Sheffield and Chase Mantinson. For more stories, investment opportunities, and information, check out our website at millionairesunveiled.com. See you next time when you'll hear from another everyday millionaire.